welcome. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvata V'Tzivanu L'Asok Direi Torah. Amen. <clears throat> and uh, we are in this quite amazing parsha of Kedoshim. Although this coming Shabbat, we are still going to be reading Acharei Mot, and Kedoshim is going to be the following week. Uh, but we had spent a few weeks on Acharei Mot, and so I just made an executive decision to, to move to Kedoshim, because we hadn't actually touched it. It's usually a combined Torah portion. It's the second of Acharei Mot Kedoshim, and uh, this is the one year when we don't separate them because oh, well, we do separate them, excuse me, because it's a leap year and uh, decided that since we hadn't touched on this at all, we should go ahead and do it anyway and maybe spend next week on it as well. So here we are. Lo ta'ashok et re'acha. We actually did look at this verse, but we didn't do the Rashi. You shall not wrong. Uh, and this, it also means withhold what is due. Et re'acha, your friend, literally it means, right? V'lo tigzol, you shall not uh, rob. Lo talin, this is interesting, interesting, interesting law. P'ulat sachir, you, you shall not retain the wages due to a hired laborer, ad boker, until morning. In other words, to delay in paying someone for the work that they've done for you. So there's an example, right? A specific example of uh, ta'ashok, right? At any rate, Rashi, lo ta'ashok. Ze ha'kovesh schar sachir. So according to the Sifra, here we're talking about someone who possibly means here to um, underpay someone, right? Uh, so that's how this is understood. Lotalin, it shall not remain overnight, right? This the person's uh, salary. Uh, so lotalin, talin is a feminine form, and Rashi points out that the verb is in the feminine, musav al hapula. So he says that's because the verb is referring to the activity of not of not paying someone. The pu'ula, right? So pu'ulat is feminine, and uh, that's why the verb is in the feminine. So here we go. Ad boker until morning. So he says the situation here is schir yom, that we're talking about a day laborer here. Hakatuv medaber. Scripture is referring to a day laborer. She yitzi ato. Because he leaves, right? He ends working when the when the sun sets. The fichach, and for the reason, and for this reason, zman gibui scharo, the time for uh, take getting paid for for the, for the wages to be paid to him, kol halayla is the entire night. In other words, you have the entire night in which to pay that day laborer, you, as long as you pay him by the next morning. And in another place, it states, it says, and the sun should not set upon him. We're talking about a night laborer. That paying him for his labor, Misha Ya'ale Amud Hashacher. The time is from sunrise. The Fichach, and for this reason, in other words, the time he's owed that money it, for a night labor is morning. The Fichach, and for this reason, Zman Gibui Scharo Kol Hayom, right? The time you have to get his wages, to pay him, are the, is the entire day. Why? Shilafi. Shenatna, because Natna Torah, the Torah gave Zman Laval Habayat, gave enough time to the Bal Habayat means literally the householder, but it means the person who hired him, right? Shona Lavakesh Maot has to give him enough half of an astronomical day in order to go and find the money to pay him. 
So in other words, you, you have the Torah, it's interesting, right? That the Torah is giving the, the person who hired, hired him time to go and collect the funds. And he has uh, 12 hours essentially to go and find the money to make sure he pays the laborer. So just interesting sort of social welfare kinds of statements. Next. You shall not curse a deaf person. And before a blind person, is what this is, a famous, famous verse. You shall not place a stumbling block. But you should fear your God. I am the Lord. So there's quite a bit to unpack here. Uh, it doesn't mean it necessarily only in its literal sense, right? So Rashi's going to take care of this for us. Lord Tekalel Cheresh, you shall not curse curse a deaf person. Ainli Ela Cheresh. So according to the literal interpretation of this, we only say you, you're not allowed to curse a deaf person. So does that mean you can curse someone who's can hear? So so how do we know that you're not supposed to curse anyone, anyone? Talmud Lomar. So for this reason, scripture states back in Exodus 22, it says, uh, actually the whole place is amongst your people, you shall not curse. So it's people, it's not, not limited to, to people who are deaf. So if that is the case, why does it st- why does it state here a deaf person? Right. So what is what is unique about a a deaf person? So Shehu uh, who's alive, and what this is saying here, and I <clears throat> I have to tell you that Safaria supplied me the translation in Safaria. Um, supplied me a better understanding of what Rashi is trying to say here. The point is here that the deaf person doesn't hear you cursing him. So he's not emotionally or otherwise affected from your words because he doesn't hear you. However, he is a living person. So this refers then to anyone who's alive that just because they don't hear you or may be unaffected by your words in terms of what they are hearing, right? It's still an improper thing to do. And just as people who are able to hear uh, and and might not be emotionally affected by what you're saying, who are exactly like people who are deaf in this situation, right? They're deaf to your words. So this refers to any living person. However, interestingly enough, Yatsa Hamet. So the point about this is that someone who is no longer living wouldn't be included in this particular law. Because he isn't alive. So again, this sort of raises other kinds of issues because it doesn't seem like a decent thing to be cursing the dead either, you know? And, and so it really does require further analysis to understand exactly where this is coming from. Well, to you begin know, with, Rabbi, what do yeah. they specifically mean by cursing someone? I mean, so, do they yeah. mean to yell out an eth- epithet, to say something nasty to them, to, to you know, like actually put... Uh, like try to put a spell on them that ruins their life, you know? Yes, I think that's the idea. That when you curse someone, you try to create a situation in their life where they're going to be cursed, right? Where they're going to have continuing trouble. Correct, correct. So the reason why this may not be forbidden for someone who's no longer living is that the curse isn't going to affect them in any way whatsoever. So well, just, you can't curse someone's afterlife because the decision has already been made correct. whether they're going to have a good afterlife correct. or not. Correct. Right, right, right. 
But we know that, you know, uttering curses regarding someone still affects their reputation in some way or another. But I think you're right, Lauren, uh, going in the direction that you're going, in that it's trying to put, as it were, a kind of spell on them. Um, yeah, so, so in that sense, the, diff the distinction would be that as a negative commandment, you've broken a negative commandment, whereas while it's not a proper thing to curse anyone, you haven't necessarily broken a commandment. It, it doesn't have the gravitas uh, with regards to a living person. And perhaps that's all it means. I, I'm just suggesting it. I'm not saying that that's what it means for sure, but I'm trying to make the distinction. And, and, and I guess it also, to me, maybe implies that you don't have to actually hear the curse for it to work. Correct, correct, yeah. Yep, right. That's that's what it's saying, and it's saying regardless, it's it's a, a negative commandment. But what mm -hmm. I don't understand, yes, is how people would have the power, especially if somebody's not hearing or aware mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. to change somebody's life if God doesn't really want that person to have a bad life. True. So this. You know, there's some there are two Torah Tamimas down here, okay? Um, and, and the second one, just glancing at it, seems to go in the direction that I did. Um, I'm trying to see if whether he, um, whether it's, uh, you know, going to help us in terms of understanding this further. Um, I think, you know, to try and respond to what you're saying, it's saying that words matter that uh, regardless, you know, even, even though we understand that God is ultimately in control, uh, nevertheless, uh, it, it has some sort of effect. Um, how mechanically that necessarily works, I'm not sure. Does this involve other sort of more mystical things? I'm not sure. Um, it's just, it's, you know, at, and at the very least in a non-mystical way, we know that that when you curse people, it, it 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 unleashes certain emotions or gives expression to certain emotions that are best kept private. So I imagine when they're talking about cursing, they're talking about not what you might have in your heart, but what you actually articulate. But as I said, there are these two Torah Tamima statements here, uh, which would also have his own personal comments there, look at that. There's quite a lot to be said. And then most of what he's saying is the next one, Leif Iver. What does it mean to say, you know, not setting up a stumbling block in front of the, of, of a blind person? So let's, let's keep going with the Rashi. If I have a chance, I may take a look at the Torah Tmima, you know, offline and see if there's anything worth sharing with you all on that. So going on, and you shall not place a stumbling block before the blind. Uh, we're talking again, this is the Sifra interpreting this, and it says, someone who's blind regarding the matter. In other words, so what's this specifically? Do not give advice. Sheena Hugenet law that is not for his benefit. Don't, in other words, he doesn't know that what you're telling him to do isn't really going to help him, and in fact may may hurt him. And and that's the stumbling block. Al Tomar, so it gives an example. Al Tomar Mahor Sadcha, don't tell him, sell your field the kachla chachamor, and use the money to buy a donkey, for ata okef alav, and what you're doing is you're actually trying to find a way for him to do something to your own personal advantage. Misinformation. Yes, correct. But especially when you benefit from it. Right. Right. That's, that's part of this too is that your intention is not really to benefit them. You know, sometimes you go to a restaurant and you ask them to make a suggestion 
regarding the menu. And all they do really is tell you the more expensive item to buy. And it's not necessarily because it's better or more. Right, or something they want to get rid of. Correct, correct. That kind of stuff. There's a relative, I mean, I'm not saying it's a terrible thing to do, but it's the same kind of thing. It's placing a stumbling block before the blind. So. But you shall fear your Lord, your God. Because these kinds of things are not given over to people to know whether the person giving this advice, <coughs> whether their intention is good or bad. Right, so it's your intention. You may give advice, and you may think it's really good advice, and you may, in fact, even be giving it to try to help the person. And guess what? Circumstances happened, and it turned out to to go against, you know, to actually be a disadvantage. But you may have not intended. You may have been quite sincere in the advice you gave to try and benefit the, the person you're advising. Right? Well, nobody is going to necessarily know what your motivations were. And it's possible for this person who, who just gave advice that hurt the person they advised to deny the Lomar and to say, I intended it for his, for, you know, it just happened to work out that way. Uh, there, are always, there are always risks involved and, and it just turned out that way. But my honest intention was to, to benefit this person. The advice I gave them, I really believed would help them, et cetera, et cetera. So nobody, nobody can really prove this. And for this reason, regarding this particular uh, law, but you shall fear your God, hamakir machshavotecha, who, un, who recognizes your thoughts. God knows your thoughts. And likewise, anything that is actually uh, is, is a devising of a person's heart. Who's doing it. But other people aren't able to tell whether he is in, what his intentions are. They're not able to tell. Regarding this, regarding all those kinds of laws, at the end of it, it's going to say, you shall fear your God. So this is actually a very lovely um, explanation of what is meant by God being God-fearing, right? It, it, it means, of course, to, that in, in your deepest heart, in your, in your secret places, you know, where no one else could ever find out what your intentions were and whether they were wicked, you still make sure that you do what's right, right? So you don't have the attitude, well, as long as no one finds out, it's okay to get away with it. And unfortunately, that's a very human, you know, human quality. So this is something really quite golden within the Torah that we're learning right now. Lo ta'asu avel bamishpat. You shall not do anything to pervert judgment. And this is what's interesting, the examples they give. Lo tisa fnei dal. You shall not favor the, the presence of the poor. In other words, you shouldn't, you shouldn't show favoritism to a poor person or disadvantaged person. For lo tehedar pnei gadol. Nor should you show honor to in the presence of a, the pne has the idea of in the presence of a great, you know, powerful person. But tzedek, in righteousness, tishpot amitecha, you shall judge your fellow. So, no favoritism. Uh, here we go. Lo ta'asu aval bamishpat, you shall not do anything to pervert judgment. Melamed, this teaches us Shahadayan Mekalkel Etadin Karui Avel. This this tells you that a judge who does something to ruin the judgment is called a a, a, perver, a pervert. Okay, I guess it is. San Ui Umishukats and explaining what Avel means. Hated, 
or Mishukatz and detested. Cherem uh, would be uh, basically uh, uh, when you cut someone off uh, from uh, from society, would to eva and disgusting. That this kind of when you are in a position of judgment and you're a judge, and if you do this, uh, you're this is this is the the upshot of it of it all, right? So cherem to put someone in a cherem means to excommunicate someone. So. But I just want to be clear that from what I understand, according to Chabad's translation, yes. it's not that he's committing a perverted act. It's that he's perverting the law, that he's, yes. you know, kind of giving a corrupt um, verdict or whatever. Right. But I have a feel, I mean, the way the Rashi seems to be saying it, okay, uh, because he says Hadayan. He says the judge mm -hmm. who does this is mm -hmm. called, etc. Yeah, right? but my and Rashi, I, go, ahead. go ahead. Please. No, I'm well, just, just saying that. Go ahead. Mine says the verse, this verse teaches us that a judge who corrupts the law is called unjust, hated, and disgusting, fit to be destroyed, and yeah. an abomination. Okay. Okay. So I think that's saying basically, so it's still, it's talking about the judge himself. Right. No, I understand. But the point. way you had put it, to me, it sounded like you could have been saying he committed some kind of act of per perversion other than just in rendering his decision. No. Okay. Then I wasn't coming across right. Um, no, I was trying to say, this is what we call the judge. That's, and, and Chabad seems to be going that way too. Right. Okay. So he says, Shaaval Karui, because perversion is called Toeva. Uh, I know they translate Toeva as abomination. I, I like, I, as I said before in a previous lesson, I like the idea of calling it disgusting. And, and Chabad doesn't say that. It says, for an unjust person yes. is called oh, an abomination. Okay, okay. I, I could go with that too. Absolutely. There are no vowels here. So, uh -huh. uh, you know, I'm comfortable with, with Chabad's translation too, right? But it seems, it doesn't, it's, it's tough because it says Ha-Avel, right? Or Evel, if, it's, if that's the non-pausal form of this particular word. I'm, I'm working without any vowels. So yes. it seems no like he could, he could he could be talking about the nature of this particular word is it could be talking about the agent, you know, known as an a noun, you know, mm -hmm. of agency, or it could be talking about the concept of Avel. Mm -hmm. So, and 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 possibly if I knew grammar, if I knew more grammar, I could be more definitive about it. But that's at least where my level of understanding is right now. And anyway, going on, Shene'emar, as it states in Deuteronomy 25, he says, Ki to avat Hashem. So this does seem to be speaking about a person, right? That, that one who is, um, gosh, uh, something that God considers disgusting, right? Kol ose avo, anyone who performs perversion, who practices perversion. And, and the idea of toeva means sort of removed, right? Like if, if you think about what the word disgusting means, it means something that we would not want to be close to. It would be something that we'd want to get away from as much as possible. So, I mean, Chabad keeps saying injustice instead of perversion. Hmm. When, you know, it sounds like perversion kind of, to me, has a connotation of more uh, sexual immorality. Yeah, no, and this not... one is just saying, you know, just an act of of not that's not just. And so I'm a little confused as to which one is really okay. Okay, meant. right. So when I think of pervert, I I could use the word pervert regarding justice to pervert justice, and that's what they're talking about. Right, it's to take something that is in, that involves a just decision and 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 change it out so that it isn't it just anymore. But I would use the word, per, I use the verb pervert to do that to justice, you know, to law. 
So, uh, you know, I'm not, I realize that perversion definitely is used in a sexual connotation as well, but that's not what I mean here. So again, it's talking about to'eva, right? Things, things that are disgusting, kruya sheketz, right? Something that, that one gets rid of. You don't, you don't have anything to do with this. The cherem, and again, likewise, it's the word that's used for, um, you know, excommunication. But that's not what it means here, of course. But it means something that you, you have nothing to do with. Shinemar again it states again it's uh, Deuteronomy chapter seven the Lord Ta'avi Toeva El Beitecha you shall not bring a disgusting thing into your house the Hayita Cherem Kamohu and you yourself will be um, I'm trying to think there's another word that's just escaping they me they use destroyed think. here. Yeah, that is a word that they use to, to, but again, there's another word, not destroyed, but um, again, uh, basically it means, you know, that nothing would, so, that nobody would have anything to do with you if you did this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Shunned. Shunned, shunned. That's the word. And you know that shunned is also another word that's used for excommunication. So I really like that. Thank you. That's helpful. Shunned. That's what I would say. Let me see if I can put in a translation here. Okay, let's see. Sorry. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. There it is. Uh, here we are. Thank you. Like it. Shekets to shaktsenu, you shall utterly shun it, right? You shall set it aside. You shall not have anything to do with it. Loti sap nedal, going on to say, you shall not favor the presence of a poor person. And again, this is all in the Sifra. So they give a specific example. You shouldn't say to yourself, or you shouldn't Did you think. finish the Rashi before that? Because... Yeah, I believe okay, so. Okay, because Chabad says... You shouldn't shun it lest you be. Yes, that's what I said. Okay, and then it says, but you shall utterly detest. Yes. Okay, yes. for every abomination to the Lord, which he hates. Yeah. Okay, I didn't hear that part. I don't know that I saw that here. Uh, here Maybe it's the Lord, el yeah. you shouldn't bring something that's disgusting into your house. Yeah. And then you will be shunned like it. Right, sheketz to shaktsenu means you know you shall utterly have nothing to do with it. Well, I guess this is parenthetical, but because it it quotes scripture, it seems important that it's from Deuteronomy twelve. Right, an abomination is called hate is as it is said for every abomination to the Lord which He hates. Hmm. Okay, so I don't see that in this particular yeah. text, and they don't even quote it. So this is Deuteronomy seven. This is Deuteronomy twenty five. So it could be that there's an addition of the Rashi that includes that as well. You know, there are different manuscripts. Right, right. Different editions. So. Okay, sorry to interrupt. No, 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 it's okay. It's good. Lotisa, so this is recognizing, right? Favoring a poor person. That you shouldn't think, anihu ze. This one is poor. And a wealthy person is obligated to support him. As Kenu Badin, I will uh, hold this person, this poor person. I will find in his favor through, you know, in the in the judgment. And so he is being supported uh, cleanly, literally in the kiyot. So um, you can't say that. That's not. You don't bring that one issue, even though it may be true that the wealthy are have an obligation to help support those who are disadvantaged. You don't pervert judgment in order to do that. The lote da pnegado, nor should you show favor to honor the, the presence of a lar, of a of a powerful person, right? Shilotomar, you shouldn't think to yourself, Ashir Huze, this one is wealthy, Ben Gdolim Huze. 
He is descended from great people. He's from a prominent family. Hey, ach ash avai shenhu. How can how how can I humiliate him? For er er bevushato onish. Okay, I'm sorry. For er er bevushato, and that I should see him humiliated. Onish yesh badavar. This is something you're forbidden to do, right? You're never supposed. I think you're all aware that humiliating someone publicly, and this is in a in a judgment, right? Lechach neymar, and for this reason, it says explicitly, "Velo tehdar pnei gadol." It means in this particular context, it has to do with favoritism. So it's not that you're out there to humiliate someone publicly. That's you have to set that aside in this in in, in, in the pursuit of justice. So again, the emphasis, right? Betzedek tishpot, through justice, you shall judge your, your fellow. Here we go. Keshem kemashmo'o, it, it means exactly what it's saying. Davar acher, another way to understand this. Hevei dan et chavecha lechaf It It says, in general, that you should judge your fellow in the scale of merit, that when you, 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 you need to assume the best regarding people, you shouldn't always assume the worst. So let's go here, we'll stop here. And we have another opportunity tomorrow to continue these particular statements in Kedoshim. And Kedoshim is really famous for these kinds of statements. I'm going to stop the share and stop the recording and hope that you've all enjoyed the material that we've been dealing with today, especially. <laughs>